Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yurgita Ashley. I am a Securities Corporate Governance and ESG Partner with Thomson Hein, also co-chair of the firm's public companies group and our ESG collaborative. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm delighted to introduce you to our panelists. Joining me today are my Thomson Hein colleagues, international trade partner Francesca Guerrero, and International Trade Managing Associate, Joy Rodriguez. Joyce and Francesca work with companies on their compliance programs. They counsel companies on export controls, sanctions, import regulations, as well as anti-bribery laws. I'm also thrilled to introduce you to Nate Herman, who is Senior Vice President at the American Apparel and Footwear Association. Nate oversees the organization's government relations department, and he also leads the association's corporate social responsibility program. Nate has a wealth of experience in trade policy, supply chain management issues, as well as compliance strategies and programs that we will be talking about today. So before we get started, just a couple of administrative matters. If you look to the right hand of your screen, you will see a handouts tab. That's where the presenter's bios, handouts, and some additional materials will be available, including the e our recent ESG survey. We will be providing CLE credit for today's program. CLE form is also posted on the right hand of your screen. Please fill it out and return it to the email address listed on the form. We will be announcing CLE tracking code a little bit later towards the end of the presentation. So thank you for your interest and let's get started with the program. We will first share a few findings from our recent ESG survey, then we'll discuss forced labor enforcement framework and some general state current state of affairs and then we'll move to discussing practical steps for risk mitiga mitigation and developing compliance programs so in august of this year we reached out to public and private companies of various market capitalizations and in various industries and we solicited their input regarding their ESG strategies, focus areas, disclosures areas. So there are just a couple of slides that we would like to share with you. As far as the disclo ESG disclosures, more than 65% of the companies identified human rights issues, ethical business practices, as well as supply and chain management, things that we will be talking about today. When asked what were the most significant ESG challenges in the next year, both private and public companies overwhelmingly identified data verification and collection efforts. Also, public companies listed supplier management, risk management, and board oversight as being significant issues. Supplier management, was even more significant for private companies, 67% of which saw that as a significant challenge. So before we move to talk about the state of affairs, David, do you mind putting up our first polling question? So if you don't mind, you can click, you can click right on your screen and we we'll try to collect some information about what industry your company operates in. And we're going to wait just a couple of minutes for these results to pop up. Okay, well, perhaps while we're waiting, 
Joyce, do you mind discussing current state of affairs for forced labor and also regulation of forced labor within supply chains? Of course, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for joining. Um, absolutely, right now, the state of affairs is absolutely in flux. Um, there's been a lot of movement around the world and also in the U.S. in terms of new requirements, new regulations, legislation that's pending. Um, more so in the last 10, 15 years than even in the previous 50 years. Um, so this is certainly a concern um, for for not just governments, but businesses, um, civil society, NGOs, and we're trying to grapple with these issues that are not new, um, but they do continue to be a growing concern around the world, particularly as supply chains are more and more complicated. Sourcing is more and more complicated, various components um, to create um, finished products. And the numbers remain out, uh, pretty astounding. Um, 25 million people around the world are subjected to forced labor, the majority of that um, in the production of goods and services. And these numbers are just rising. Um, and so I wanted to frame this in terms of human rights because this is a, a, a human rights issue. Um, and it's not just a foreign country issue. Um, it's also a domestic issue. Um, something that everyone is trying to figure out how to deal with. Of course, um, the ILO has been doing this for many, many years. In 1930, the Forced Labor Convention number 29 uh, was one of the first uh, standard setting um, conventions that really talked about what is forced labor and provided a definition that most governments um, and companies use. Um, and in 2014, that was modernized to include, um, can anybody see me? Can you hear me, Amy? I, I saw you for a second, but then everyone disappeared. All right, well, I'll continue. So in 2014, uh, that protocol was modernized um, because there, as I mentioned, there's been a movement and a growing concern in this area uh, with more specific guidance, uh, what effective measures companies can take to prevent. And there have been an overwhelming amount, uh, an overwhelming amount of countries that have ratified the protocol, 56 countries. So whether or not um, they're moving in the same direction in terms of uh, internal regulations and legislation, at a minimum, everybody has um, recognize that this is an issue that must be grappled with um, on a global um, nature. The convention also, I think, I mean, one of the most important things that was has been created by the ILO are these forced labor indicators as um, governments continue to figure out what the different modalities of forced labor are, what does it look like, how do we identify, it, how can we prevent it. Um, these are the 11 indicators that have been identified, uh, governments are relying on these and so are businesses to create policy, to um, uh, create and justify their findings of forced labor. Um, and they're really at the core of, of this movement. And they're also available um, in the handouts as well, the ILO publication. So how are governments actually dealing with this right now? What does the legal framework look like? Um, so there's an array of various different um, restrictions, requirements, and sanctions in place. They can all fall into four different buckets. We're going to focus more on the import restrictions in terms of um, U.S. Customs Border Protection um, enforcement of the prohibition on uh, importation of goods made whole or in part using forced labor, but there are many others. Um, there are disclosure requirements that require companies to publish policies, risks, and mitigation measures. And there are a couple examples there, depending on the jurisdiction and the size of the company. Sometimes, and I think the movement is more towards intermingling this with the due diligence uh, requirements, uh, which are those that require companies to really look into their supply chains um, identify and remediate risks, um, a movement towards more transparency 
um, in those supply chains and putting the onus on the companies within the jurisdictions with these requirements to push down um, some of these requirements and um, codes of conduct, et cetera. And a recent change that's uh, very interesting and complex as well has been sanctions targeting um, particular individuals, government officials, um, regions as well um, with uh, blocking sanctions, um, but also export controls of particular technologies and goods going to support um, these bad actors engaged in this type of activity. Um, one example is the Xinjiang designations, but also the global dignity sanctions um, and the, the entity list designations of, of similar entities and individuals. And of course, this is not just happening in the US, it's happening all over the world. Um, the most interesting, I think, are the, the movement is the movement in the EU in general um, towards more due diligence requirements. The German human rights due diligence law was passed in June of this year, and it does have um, requirements on a year to year basis if your company meets a certain threshold of, of income, and that actually goes down year by year. Um, to encompass and impose these types of requirements on more and more companies um, to really look into uh, what their supply chains are doing, uh, provide due diligence, what you know, what, how are they preventing this? Are they pushing down supplier chain codes of conduct to the first tier, second tier, third tier um, without in their supply chain? Um, and we're seeing this as well in the proposed EU legislation on mandatory human rights due diligence which we expect to be on the books in the next couple of years. Um, so it's certainly a movement um, beyond just public disclosure of what you are doing, what you wish you were doing into, okay, what actually are you doing right now um, to, make, to make this change? In the US, the most important piece of legislation is uh, in terms of import restrictions is section 307 of the Tariff Act. The definition of forced labor in this is very similar to the Forced Labor Convention 29 definition uh, with some nuances and you can even see some of the ILO indicators um, sprinkled in here. Um, labor that is performed involuntarily under menace of penalty or property of the worker. And this prohibits the importation into the US of merchandise produced in whole or in part by forced or child labor. So Joyce, if there is a finished good that's being imported to the United States and there was a forced labor issue someplace down the supply chain, for example, a supplier used cotton, does that mean that the finished good is being prohibited, the import is prohibited? The short answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, the broad language in, the, in section 307 encompasses in whole or in part, so if there is a finished product that is imported into the US with, into the US with some component or some sourcing um, from an identified um, company, region, or commodity that is produced through forced labor, um, that would absolutely be um, restricted and prohibited from importing into the US. There is no de minimis requirement. There's no, there hasn't been a carve out in Section 307 um, for, you know, some sort of threshold below which the quantity or the value um, would be carved out. So that essentially would be, and how um, CPV would do that would be through these withhold release orders. Um, whenever there's any reasonable um, evidence indicating that the merchandise is produced with any forced labor, CPV issues these WROs and it directs all the ports of entries to detain these shipments. Um, and, can I, yeah. Can I interject? I, I just was looking at the questions. We have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to read a couple out. Um, and I would encourage people to ask questions by typing them into the little question question box on the right. We'll, we'll try and address them if they're relevant to what's being on the slide right then. If not, we'll kind of pause for questions periodically. Um, so one of them is, how does customs know if forced labor is an issue for an import transaction? What sort of, um, you know, how, how might they um, identify potential problems and how do they then um, investigate 
those potential problems. We appear to have disappeared again, but don't worry, we're, we're, we're still here, just the webcams <laughs> may not be working right. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a, there's a few ways. Um, one is this WRO way. They um, Anybody can really submit some, an EE allegation, um, NGOs, NGO reporting information. Um, they look at the 11 ILO indicators, um, in particular regions with respect to particular companies and with respect to particular commodities. Um, so that's one way where they gather that information. Um, they can also issue findings so on particular companies um, and that's something that they do through their own kind of investigation and there's ways that um, companies can respond to this um, they also do it through audits um, conducting pretty thorough and intense audits um, forced labor audits um, asking tough questions about um, your compliance um, and then digging into supply chains. Um, does anybody else want to jump in on that question? Yeah, I, I would be happy to jump in. It's sort of hard to tell who's jumping in because we can't see the That's fine. results on the screens. Um, yeah, the, um, this has been an issue with, with US Customs and Border Protection. Uh, they, uh, as you noted, Joyce, they're they base their decision whether to issue a WRO, and then um, if it's a region-wide WRO, um, to uh, detain a shipment based on uh, reasonable evidence. Um, the definition of re reasonable evidence is non-existent at this point, um, and uh, and Customs has decided that it does not have to provide that evidence to the importer that has their shipment detained or the importer is subject to a withhold release order. Um, and so this is a subject of some controversy because uh, then it leaves the importer in the, in the bad position of trying to prove a negative. Basically you're guilty until proven innocent because you don't know what the evidence is against you. But, um, but from our, our work on a number of these withhold release orders, it seems to be related to um, what other U.S. government entities have reported, what's been reported out by non-governmental organizations and advocacy groups, um, and uh, listing of companies in the, in the press seem to be sources that that U.S. Customs and Border Protection use. But in some cases, we can't figure out why Customs is targeting shipments from a particular importer, um, and that uh, that gets back to the fact that Customs has decided that uh, it's not going to share the evidence with, with the importer or with the general public. And I think that um, we'll, we'll discuss this in a little bit more in depth later, but you know, th there is a link in the materials to the Customs WROs, so you can see you know which ones have been issued, but it's also important to sort of be watching the news, be paying, paying attention to your own supply chain to know what might be coming down the pike. Um, and I, I see in the comments, we'll talk about like some of the software tools in a bit, but you know, there, there are ways to monitor um, potential allegations as well and kind of anticipate potential WROs. Do you want to jump into the next slide, Joyce? Sure. And Joyce, is there a particular reason about why such an increase in enforcement of customs? Yeah, so um, I'm sure people, it seems like there are way more WROs in the past 10 years than there have been, and it's because it's true. Um, it, since ninth, from 1958 to like 2015, there were about 38 WROs that were issued. After that, um, there have been 31. Um, and this is mainly due to the repeal of the consumptive demand clause in section 307 which provided that if insufficient goods were being made in the u.s to meet um, consumptive demand in the u.s there was this exception um, to this prohibition on importation um, and then it that was um, included in the in the trade facilitation and trade enforcement act and when it became law in 2016 um, there was a movement uh, within 
CPB to create a forced labor working group. They've been working really, really hard and have been providing a lot of guidance um, with grappling with these issues. What is this going to look like? Um, how are we going to restrict? How are we going to enforce these provisions more broadly? Um, and with that working group and with their recommendations, we've seen a, a jump in enforcement and in these WROs. And I will, and I did put here the 2021 examples because they're really interesting examples. And I encourage everyone to look at um, FAQs when they do come out, as Nate mentioned. Um, it's difficult to understand what CPB is trying to do and explain that to clients is also difficult. Um, so generally speaking, these are broadly interpreted um, and the FAQs at least provide some information that is, is more useful. And then this just um, goes through the really high evidentiary burden to prove a negative that Nate was talking about. It's not, these are, and these are not just, you know, the first tier, tech, second tier, this is throughout the entire supply chain, you know, to prove that negative that he was talking about. And of course, these types of documents are not um, customary, you know, in, in customary business practice is not something you're getting from every single component down the line of, of throughout your supply chain. So it's it's something difficult that Nate and Francesca will talk about a little bit more. And then just to close here, um, it's not just WROs uh, that can be issued by CPB. They can make findings uh, against companies and their civil penalties. Um, like with Pure Circle, Stevia was penalized over five hundred thousand um, dollars last August um, for uh, their use of Stevia leaves that were produced from convict labor. Um, there's also potential criminal penalties, which we haven't seen, but those are in the um, Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, uh, which also produces a civil cause of action for victims of forced labor. And then, as I mentioned briefly before, and I think um, we'll talk a little bit more about, is these forced labor audits. Um, they're very broad. They ask a lot of very specific questions, um, particularly sometimes even requesting, what are you doing about, you know, collecting these types of documents? Do you have forced labor policies in place and, um, and other issues? Thank you, Joyce. Uh, Francesca, Nate, now that we have seen the many ways how forced labor can appear in supply chains, can you talk a little bit about what companies can do when they try to tackle this? Thanks, Rikina. Of course. Let's let's go to the next slide. And I think our polling questions are not working, everyone, by the way. So we had some exciting polling questions, but we decided to have excitement with the rotating webcams instead. <laughs> Francesca, they, they are working now. I oh, they are working. Okay. Should we try poll uh, number two? Or should we try poll? Let's, let's go for poll two. Let's see if it works. So this is just, does your company have a written po um, policy prohibiting forced labor? And I believe you check by clicking on the screen. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So we'll and give that a minute and then just see if it works, if we can actually collect the data and show it. Yeah, we have the results coming in about 57% on so far. Okay, I think we can probably close the poll. Um, so we've got, um, let's see, I, I see the results and it says that 75% says yes, 25% no. So that's, um, oh, there we go. That's a good data point. Um, and of course, you know, a written policy can take many different forms. It can be part of your supplier code of conduct, part of a broader human rights policy, or it can be standalone. Um, okay, so let's move back to our first slide here. Um, sort of one of the first steps is to identify your risk. Um, and you know, fundamental questions to think about are, do you know where your goods and their components are made? Um, do you know what, and, and just to stop there for a second, um, I'll say, and Nate, you can chime in if you know different, 
I, um, I, I've worked with a number of companies who are in industries that are grappling with forced labor sort of newly. And they don't necessarily have some sort of formal mechanism for checking, you know, keep, keeping track of, of these goods yet. Yeah, some of them are developing that. Um, but what I, I have found, which is kind of positive, is that if you get the um, production or, or quality or whoever's in charge of purchasing components and, and design involved in this discussion, and it's not just compliance folks trying to deal with this themselves, um, you can actually answer this question pretty easily. And, and if you tell them, which is our second piece, sort of what industries and regions pose elevated risks in your supply chain, they, they, they can actually generally, at least, uh, you know, first pass, <laughs> hitting a lot of them, tell you whether you're likely to have uh, various components downstream in your supply chain because they understand the products much better than the compliance folks do. Um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that point, um, Nate. Well, that, that's, those are all very good points um, because they're, they're the ones who are um, sourcing the materials that go into the final product. And that brings up the issue that in many cases, in fact, in most cases, the forced labor is not occurring at the production of the final product. It's occurring up the supply chain, um, either in the materials or in some cases in our industry in particular, going all the way back to the raw material. And so you really need to have that full visibility which your QA and product development people can help you uh, on that so that you understand, you know, in our case, where the cotton's coming from, where the where the cattle hides or leather is coming from, where the polysilicone is coming from. And I can talk about that in a moment, um, you know, if you're talking about solar panels. Uh, and so that's that's where you, you really need to have that visibility way up the supply chain, the traceability and transparency way up the supply chain because forced labor in the majority of cases are not at the final product level. And that's, thank you for that. And we have some questions along these lines too. So how do you start tackling these questions if you haven't already dug into this issue? So how, how does a company go about collecting this type of data? I mean, I think it, we'll, we'll talk in one slide about some some basic steps kind of everyone can do. But when we're focusing on identifying risk, I think one place to start is like Department of Labor, um, other organizations issue goods that have a heightened risk of forced labor. Start there talking with your company about which products you might have upstream in your supply chain. This discussion, you know, Nate was just saying, um, as you build out your program, you can get more sophisticated, but that's like, if you're asking where to start, let's let's start there. Yeah, I mean, there's there's public sources, as as Francesca mentioned, uh, this Department of Labor puts out a number of reports, Department of State has their trafficking persons report, their country reports on human rights practices around the world. Um, so there's the government reports you can use uh, that could give you an indication, oh, well, if you're, in the building industry that bricks made in certain countries have, have issues or, or things like that. Um, and then you can work with your product development and, and QA people to figure out, okay, are the bricks coming from these high risk regions? Um, and there are private entities as well. Um, Mablecroft is a big one that can help you determine risks. Uh, there's Elevate has an EIQ uh, initiative. There's BSI screen program. There's a lot of programs out there that can help you determine risk. But in addition, what we're talking about is, is the key here is, is sort of getting the documentation to, to know where your, your products are coming from. And so that's starting to work with your suppliers and in turn your supplier suppliers to gather information and in a way that is provides hopefully incentives for them to provide that information and doesn't provide disincentives for them to provide that information. We can talk about that later as well. And a number of these resources, we don't have them on the slides, but we have them in the materials, like links to, to these websites where you can find information about um, high, high risk commodities and, and locations. Um, and then just another, um, you know, factor I'd point out, um, you know, do your key employees understand red flags for child and forced labor? Um, 
many of you, many of your companies don't necessarily do forced labor related audits, but you do other audits. Like you're going to have someone going to check and see if um, they're meeting quality standards or um, perhaps environmental or other other standards. And you know th th those employees who are who are going out, you know are one of the key employees who should be educated about these risk factors. They, they won't be, you know, penetrating all the way into your supply chain, but um, th they can be alert to, to things that they see, hear, um, learn, as well as, again, sort of the procurement and, you know, supplier personnel who are negotiating agreements. Um, you know, some of the red flags might be extremely low prices compared to you know, the rest of the market. Um, so they can be educated about those pieces. Do you want to add anything before we move? Yeah, on? it's it's it really is a whole company approach here is that the this can't be somebody just in the general counsel's office or in compliance trying to figure this out on their own. Is that you really need the the sourcing folks, you you need um, the product development QA folks engaged um, and aware of the issues and then trained to, as, as Francesco described, to, to know the red flags because they're likely in a lot more than compliances than, social, than doing a social compliance audit. They're in the factory a lot more or dealing with the suppliers a lot more directly than, than you are. And so uh, those are the people that need to be sort of your front lines and trying to address this issue. And so they need to be Bought into this and then train to to be able to help you do this. I think um, next slide. Oh wait, I did put some in the slides. I I said I hadn't, but um, I did. So these are some of the um, key tools we just uh, mentioned. Obviously, the first one is a list of products subject to a WRO, but more broad will be TOL's list of goods produced by child or forced labor, like at risk country and commodities. Um, state has a really good responsible sourcing tool, tool that not only kind of helps you identify risk areas, but also will give you some resources for like step-by-step -step addressing that risk, like creating questionnaires to, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the ILO indicators of forced labor, something to keep circling back to um, when you're doing your training, when you're building out your program, when you're doing your risk assessment. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so then I think the next step after you've kind of been thinking about where your risk is, is to really start putting in place compliance best practices. And it sounds like um, a number of you already have policies prohibiting forced labor. Um, you also want to think about the ILO indicators align with them, but um, you know, think about where your policies are and how they flow down to your lower tier suppliers. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about making that contractually enforceable as well, but, um, you know, does your supplier code of contact, you know, is it required to be flowed down to the sub, you know, suppliers? Um, that's a best practice. And then continually promoting awareness through training, which is, you know, we did just discuss, but, it, it should be something that, um, you know, key employees start hearing again and again. Um, I think this is something that's going to be growing on the, the employment um, training dashboard as, um, as just important for key employees and also, you know, a, a higher level training for a wider net of employees as well. And Francesca, so you mentioned the categories of employees who should receive the training. How frequently do you recommend that? Is it an annual training? Is it something? So, for example, we see some companies who post their California supply chain disclosures, right? Or UK or Australia, whichever one it is. And then uh, sometimes they haven't been updated for a very long time and they may say something about the training. So what's what's your recommendation as far as like grabbing your arms around it? Um, I, well, I, I two big comments. I like Nate's uh, comment, the whole of company approach, right? And the um, also right-sized uh, approach to compliance. So I think there's no one size fits all when it comes to training. It depends on your risk assessment 
you know, if you have a lot of risk, I, I imagine many of the people in the AAFA have um, regular training, um, you know, key employees there. So, some other industries may not see the same level of risk, but I, I do think key, if you're talking about key employees, probably most companies with a global supply chain, it should be like, they should think about annual training. I mean, that's just a kind of a rule of thumb for like the core. Um, but it's also about with the whole company talking about it all the time. It's not just like the formal training, but making sure management is giving the message of how important this is, making sure it's an issue for discussion, um, an appropriate um, um, business unit meetings and planning. I'm interested in your thoughts, Nate. <laughs> Sorry, just trying to find a microphone button there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I think you're right on target there, Francesca, is that um, this is something that, that can't be a, a one-off training, but it really does depend on your company and the risk in your company as well as in your industry. Um, obviously, our industry has been on the firing line of, of these withhold release orders most recently as it relates to Xinjiang and the Uyghur issue. Um, and so these trainings need to be happening more often. Things change, the, where the risk is can change. Um, and and it's, it's good to make sure people are aware of that. And personnel changes. So, so you, you know, the QA people that have been, were going in the factory two years ago might not be with the company anymore. So you have to make sure that the new QA people are trained and know what to look for when they go into a factory or, or a sub supplier. And so that, that's really important as well. But it is, uh, it is basically, there's no cookie cutter approach. It depends on your company and your situation. And then we have, thank you, Nate. And then we have a couple of questions along the same lines. Would any sort of training be mandated or coordinated with the government or the local level of your chamber, chamber of commerce, board of trade chapters? As of now, no, there, there's no government mandated training and I don't foresee any, at least from the U.S. government or even uh, local governments where a lot of procs are made uh, as of right now. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any standard necessarily industry training. There are industry groups that deal with certain issues uh, just as we do, uh, but I don't know of any that has any sort of standard required training. There are a lot of services that do offer training. So if you wanna use the third party to conduct the training can do that, or you can conduct it internally. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. There's educational institutions that do that. There's uh, auditing firms that do that, um, certification initiatives that, that provide that kind of training as well. Um, so there's, there's dozens of resources out there uh, that you can pull on, but there's no standard for better or for worse. And then I think also, thank you. And I think we also have a question that probably goes to supply and chain strategy in general. It asks, asks about disclosure and providing this type of information. So I guess I, I can take this one. I would say that it's, it's challenging to collect this data since it relates to not only your direct suppliers, but also suppliers down the chain. And then it's important once that data is collected to run it through the company's disclosure controls and procedures and also integrate it into the company's risk management strategies. And as far as whether or not this information is being disclosed, I would statistics varies, but probably more than 50% of the companies provide some sort of disclosure regarding their supply chains, whether it's just on the internet or even like a separate report that's being kept and then provided on a ad hoc basis or whether it's being put on sustainability reports or in some cases even in companies filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And as far as like running it down the chain, and Francesca and Nate, you can probably speak to that as well. It often gets included or incorporated into the company's supplier codes of conduct. So that's which then get incorporated in, into the commercial agreements with the suppliers as one of the means to try to coordinate this type of effort. 
you know, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, that, yeah. So the transparency issue is, and how do you share this information you you gather about your supply chain? There is an increasing amount of pressure from from NGOs, labor groups, and, and advocacy groups to share that information and go beyond just the first tier where the final product is made. Um, and so uh, there is larger pressure. You have to keep in mind what you give you said in terms of making sure you're not sharing inappropriate information, but there is an increasing pressure towards transparency. But also you need to be have a mechanism where you can share that information quickly because what if your, your shipment is subject to detention from US Customs Border Protection, you need to be able to pull that data very quickly and share that data with US Customs Border Protection so you can get that shipment released and get the detention order lifted. Um, if it takes you weeks or months to gather that information all in one place, that puts you really behind the eight ball to, to respond. Um, and that means your shipment's held that whole time. I think, um, it, do we have a next, is the next slide talking about, um, um, we need to have a slide talking about sort of preparing to respond to WRO. Um, and there we go. And, and so we can backtrack, um, just to piggyback on what Nate was saying. Um, it, it's, you, you saw the documents that Joyce put up. It's, I think, extremely unlikely that any company will have all of those pieces in place through their supply chain to respond to a WRO and, and, and have a shipment released. Um, so what you need to do is, you know, in the first pass, yes, keep track of them so you know what's happening. Um, you can stop or return shipments, maybe if they're in the water. Um, but if you have something detained by CBP, you want to be thinking in advance about aligning your contracts with incentives throughout your supply chain so they need to produce documents. I mean, you certainly don't want to be going to them and asking them for things that are like, uh, what's in it for me? That's a lot of work, you know? Um, so, so you need to be able to either, you know, seek some kind of claim against them or um, have some sort of, incentive or, or stick that compels them to assist you in responding to um, this WRO in a timely timely way. Um, that's kind of the best. <laughs> I mean, so, so some of the pieces, maybe you can start collecting it. Okay, actually, let me back up. If you have an area that you know is high risk, and, and you've got products that you are already aware, you know, a good chance they might be stopped, then you want to start collecting these documents. Um, and you want to have that ready to, to, to demonstrate. Um, but we're talking about, or I was talking about the situation where you're surprised by a WRO. <laughs> um, if, you, if you know that you've got something in the offing or you've got other, you know, high risk items, you do want to start looking at collecting um, data that shows the sh you know the, the transit of the potentially problematic goods that that you think is clear because it was sourced from someone else or um, from a factory that doesn't use forced labor you want to be able to have the documentation that shows it moving from stage to stage in the supply chain um, and get that ready in advance um, also one thing to think about is how will you communicate the fact that you have products that are detained or the fact that you have um, you know, potential forced labor in your supply chain um, to your investors, the public, um, you know, in, in the immediate um, situation and, and sort of having a, a group of people who have thought about this in advance and have a action plan is definitely smart. Um, anyone want to add on this one? I'll jump in again. I know I jump in all the time here, but <laughs> no, <laughs> so you're the, not jumping in. Yeah. You're, you're you're talking. <laughs> so uh, what Francesca brings up is a good point with the incentives to get your supply chain to produce those documents because, in some cases, with the high risk, you know, obviously if you know you in certain areas high risk, that's where you should focus your resources and energies first to try and get it as ahead of it as you can. Um, but but you need to be very careful. You need to provide incentives, but you also need to be careful on how you ask for that. Um, as a lot of companies and a lot of industries are learning about with uh, what's happening with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and that issue is that um, this is government sanctioned, government orchestrated 
forced labor, and the forced labor is part of a much larger um, strategy of basically repressing uh, uh, an entire ethnic culture. So it's 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 a Chinese government policy that where forced labor is only one component of a much larger campaign of oppression against Uyghurs. Um, and when you have that situation, China has put a, a number of um, mechanism in place, including a new anti-sanctions law that makes it very difficult for Chinese suppliers to comply with the U.S. withhold release order on Xinjiang. Um, and so when you're asking for this information and why you're asking for this information, not only do you need the incentives in there, but you also need to be careful not to use words like Uyghurs or Xinjiang and just say that you're collecting this information because you're trying to make sure there's no forced labor in general in the supply chain and, and we keep it very broad, which is better anyway, because that means you can use that those contract instruments with any of your suppliers, not just suppliers from China or from a certain region. Um, uh, and that's the way it should be because this is not, these issues are not one off. Forced labor is going to continue to be a sort of a scourge um, in industry for many years to come in many different forms as, as people try different things to avoid what we try and do to prevent forced labor. And so you need to be very careful on how you do that so that these suppliers are willing to give you the information in such a way that they're not going to get in trouble with the Chinese government or with their local government. Um, and so that's, that's very important. But also it gets back to, um, getting back to what we were talking about with Francesca's gives, if it's a surprise or not, this is where you really have to pay attention to what's going on. The Hoshine WRO that Joyce mentioned earlier was on silica-based products. Uh, the US government, US Customs Border Protection been telegraphing for well over a year that they were gonna take some sort of action against polysilicone from Xinjiang. 20% of the world's polysilicone is made in Xinjiang. Um, and uh, polysilicone is a key ingredient in most solar panels, uh, key input in most solar panels. And so people knew about that for well over a year. And so when the WRO happened, although it created a lot of other confusion because they didn't say polysilicone, they said silica-based products and didn't say Xinjiang specifically, they created, you know, CBP made a mess of it as they have been doing in a lot of cases. Um, it should not have been a surprise. There should have been people preparing for that for well over a year to try and get that information from the supply chain to know where their highest risk was. And so that's where you really need to be paying attention to what's going on. You can't just hide your head in the sand. You really need to be aware of, of what's going on. So Nate and Francesca, like, you know, whether we're talking about China or another region or supply chain in general, this, this data that we're talking about, it's extremely problematic to collect challenging and it's challenging to collect it from your direct suppliers uh, not even speaking about moving beyond that but I, we do have a question and they wanted to ask you if you had any recommendations what should companies do if they are purchasing their materials from brokers and then brokers are not willing to share the sources well can we back up maybe to the prior slide while we're talking about this um So what should they do about brokers who are not willing to convey their sources? Um, I mean, I think you should be extremely judicious. Um, and it, 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 certainly any product that's potentially um, at risk, you're opening yourself up to um, heartache if you're using a broker that's not willing to convey sources. And I... And, I would find it hard to recommend that any of my clients use brokers that won't recommend sources and won't at least give certain information. So maybe they won't tell you exactly who it is because they're afraid you'll like cut them out and you know take the business away from them. But will they give certain representations and certifications um, in forced labor in other areas? You know about the products. Will they? Um, you know what what can they tell you besides where exactly they got it? Um, but honestly, if you've got a WRO, you, you aren't going to be able to satisfy them with a broker who says, we, we can't tell you where it is. Um, so that, that's a, definitely a risk that you're taking as a company. Um, sorry, Nate. 
I mean, you're exactly right. I, uh, there's no other better way to say it. If, if you have that, you Joyce showed the documentation that, that you're going to need. If you if you're missing a key component of that, um, you're you're not going to be able to get your uh, detention order lifted. And this is a serious impact on companies for in our industry under the the Xinjiang WROs on cotton and on XPCC. We've literally had over a thousand shipments detained or turned away because of withhold release orders. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, probably over a billion dollars at this point of, of shipments that have been detained. And only a handful of them have been released, um, maybe a dozen, maybe a little bit more. And so you know, it's this is critically important and you're losing the product that you'll have to destroy or go through the expense of re-exporting. Thank you. And then, Francesca, I think you're probably going to go there anyway, but like look, looking at your slide and thinking about these issues of collecting data, you have questionnaires on here. And so how, how would the companies decide who to send them out to? Do you send them out to every single one of your suppliers? Do you sort of do some sort of risk assessment and send it to subgroups? Well, I think the um, this questionnaire is mostly geared at your direct suppliers, identifying which ones you need to give more scrutiny to and which ones you need to move perhaps beyond to the next tier. Um, but there are probably some practical um, balancing act you can do, I mean, based on volume and value, um, based on, you know, <laughs> Let's see, other other practical um, <laughs> volume and value are the two that really come to mind that are, are not related to the inherent risk. Um, but you know, if you have just thousands and thousands of suppliers and you're saying, where do I start? Well, you probably want to start in the higher risk geographies. You want to start with the you know the ones that have a potential for the commodities that you think are at higher risk. Um, you know, another sort of method to sort of help identify the higher risk entities as industry platforms and initiatives. Um, I, I really I want to encourage um, people in different industries to keep working together collaboratively. I think that, that that's um, a great way to to try and pull, pull resources. Um, and, you know, I don't know, Nate, if you want to say anything about some of those initiatives. Yeah, for example, uh, we we have joined with the other apparel and retail associations and uh, about, I guess, about two years ago now, we created something called the Joint Association for Labor Working Group, where we discuss uh, all of these issues. It was focused on Xinjiang originally because that was the biggest driver in the apparel and retail space. But really, we're talking about the withhold release order process in general finding innovative approaches to due diligence to get that documentation, to get uh, the transparency and traceability throughout the supply chain. Um, and, and that work has expanded well beyond the apparel and retail industry. We have the solar industry, we have consumer electronics, we have um, some food categories that are participating. And, the, and it's really open that if an association joins, then the working group is open up to all the association's members as well. So encourage folks if, uh, to, to see if your association's engaged and if you want to get engaged, just uh, have them reach out to me. This due diligence is really extremely time consuming. So companies have to figure out how to use their resources smart, uh, smartly. Um, and collaborative industry work, I think, is really eventually what's going to be necessary. Um, but I also think, obviously, identifying your own higher risk third parties so you can focus your your uh, resources there is also key. Um, and then, Francesca, again, you're probably going there in a way, but Nate to refer to innovative approaches. And then earlier, we had some questions about potential software solutions. Like, is there are there more novel ways to trace all of this information, to track it? There is, and I, I'm, Nate's going to tell us a lot about that because he's seen many, um, many presentations, right? <laughs> I think one important thing is that 
not all of them are yet accepted by CPP, but um, but there are a lot of things out there that are exciting, and there are some you know some good tools. Yeah, I mean, uh, regrettably, what people won't want to hear, oh, there's this silver bullet. You just choose this one technology solution or this other solution provider and everything will be solved. You'll be able to get full transparency in your supply chain, get all the answers that you need, um, get all the documentation you need. Um, regrettably, there isn't something like that that exists today. Um, so there are a lot of technology solutions out there um, that uh, particularly if you're trying to go back to the raw material that use uh, chemical isotope tracing, biomapping, DNA mapping, DNA tagging to try and um, determine the source of the material, even once that material is in the final product. So being able to determine the source for, our, in our instance, the source of the cotton, even if you only have the finished shirt or the finished pants. Um, and so, uh, None of those are foolproof yet. Um, and again, as Francesca mentioned, we don't know if any of those are being accepted at this time by CBP. Um, CBP has done some work with a couple of the companies, but but they haven't told us if they're accepting that they're, they want the documents that Joyce referred to earlier. Um, there's also uh, a lot of sort of um, blockchain solutions for trying to organize all the data that you're collecting. A uh, problem for a lot of our member companies is they're collecting all this data and putting it into an Excel spreadsheet, which then you can't share with anybody. And if you need to provide the information quickly, you're up a creek without a paddle. Um, and so trying to use blockchain solutions to try and share the information that's gathered um, and try and be able to present it to the, the various stakeholders that need to see it when, when you need to show it. And finally, there's other approaches like crowdsourcing you know, getting all the information that you collect into a database, compare it with a hundred other companies who might share some of the same suppliers and see if their suppliers are giving you this, giving you the same answers they gave them. Um, and so that can give you an idea of where there might be problems in the documentation that you've collected. Um, and so I think in the end of the day, it's going to be some combination of these, but the reason that we need these uh, is that in some cases, the traditional approaches to due diligence don't work. Usually due diligence involved in audit. Uh, in many cases, you can't uh, go into these countries. And, and again, in the Xinjiang region of China, you cannot bring an auditor in there right now to check for forced labor. Um, they will literally be taken off a plane or stopped at the border to, to go in. And so you need these innovative approaches to supplement the traditional due diligence that you would ordinarily conduct. Um, let's move forward a couple slides. And I think we might have one more poll if we want to try and squeeze it in, although we've only got a couple minutes before our CLE code. Um, is that the last slide? Can you move forward? Oh, or questions? Okay. Um, so maybe we will ask our third poll before we open it up to more questions. Um, David, can you throw that up? Okay. Again, I think you just click on the screen and um, I'm pretty sure the responses are anonymous. Okay, it's kind of like watching a popcorn pop when I see fewer responses trickling in. I'm like, okay, we're gonna cut the poll off. <laughs> um, it's about roughly split, it looks like, um, in terms of whether there's forced labor due diligence or not. Um, so, you know, for those of you who um, are not yet conducting forced labor due diligence, I would again circle back to, you know, where to start. You know, look at the the items you're 
sourcing to see which might have high risk inputs. Try, try to identify those um, with your team and then start using things like this supplier, you know, supplier questionnaires for, for the highest risk ones. That's that's really where to begin. Um, you know, as this area continues to develop um, regulatory pressure, you know, I think that your programs will continue to get more mature, and um, you will probably develop ways of assessing more formally who are the high-risk third parties, where do we send these questionnaires, um, who do we need to dig down and visit potentially, or who, you know, do we need to require certifications of certain um, certain high-risk um, suppliers or audits and such? But just you know, start with like looking at those um, DOL um, lists, trying to figure out which items in your supply chain might be might be problems because CBP is just you know enforcement in this area is going to continue to grow from CBP globally. The disclosure requirements are going to continue to get uh, more robust, um, so it's good to, you know, start working now. Um, and then I think, unless anyone has any less comments, we should probably do the CLE code and then kind of open it up to questions. Well, let, let's do so. CLE code is TH one zero zero five two one A. Again, the tracking code is TS and Tom H. One zero zero five two one A as an apple, and then Francesca, what about you? Work with companies a lot and design and compliance programs. Do you see any sort of mistakes that are recurring that are common? Um, well, the easiest mistake to make that I do see, regrettably, often is people making claims that they just don't that are not sustained, like disclosing something in a California supply chain, um, Transparency Act disclosure, other disclosure that that um, are not supported. So I would say definitely to your point, you know, about disclosures, um, you know, think think carefully about those. And, and if they're aspirational, then they should certainly be phrased in an aspirational way. <laughs> um, yeah, I absolutely agree with that, especially when we're talking about our goals and commitments and sort of the scope of our undertakings as well. So uh, what about best practices? Joyce, Nate, Francesca, any of you, do you have any tips to share as we wrap up here? I can jump in quickly um, just to emphasize again the really the importance on geographic risk and at least focusing on the regions and commodities that you know are troublesome. Um, and it sounds very obvious, um, but as Nate mentioned, like with the polysilicon industry, maybe that industry had a heads up, you know, beforehand, but with the WRO being so broad um, and focusing on silica-based products, even if 20% of polysilicon is coming from the Xinjiang region, it was the number for silica-based products was extremely high. There are mines in the Xinjiang region, um, and this clients were, you know, construction clients like surfactants. There's so many different uh, variety of materials that have silica-based. So it's kind of staying on top of just understanding where you are actually sourcing things from. Because with Xinjiang, it, it's a special case and it's difficult, but it's relatively simple to understand if it's coming from there or not. And then that's already, you know, the first place where you can look and really create the first set of procedures that you're going to have in place in, in terms of forced labor risk assessment and addressing that risk. Yeah, choice base is a really good point. I mean, we even got dragged into the silica based products withhold release order because, uh, for example, with shoes and clothes, when we transport them, in order to prevent mold and keep the shipments dry, we use silica gel packets, which is a silica-based product. And now all of a sudden we're co covered by this WRO, which was supposed to be on polysilicone. So, um, so yeah, that was a huge surprise to us as well. And so, uh, so sometimes you can't prepare, but again, you know the region that is in question there is that 
you don't want any nexus in this case with Xinjiang or with Uyghurs being trafficked to other parts of China. And so you need to be looking at those issues ahead of time, even if your industry is not on the firing line at this particular time, because as Joyce just noted, it could be by intent or by accident, <laughs> as in the case of CBP. Um, and so uh, you really, really need to keep that in mind. But also you need to realize where it can come in. It can come in at the raw material level. It could be government sanctions. It could be, um, it could be uh, a migrant worker issue, uh, where it's an area that, that can be a big issue. So countries like Malaysia and Taiwan and Korea that use large migrant worker forces, they could be in a forced labor situation, mostly indentured labor situation where their passports are taken away or they're, um, they have to pay for their jobs in some way. And so you need to be looking at where those high risks are in your supply chain. And those are some of the best practices you can apply. Thank you, Nate. Francesca, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, 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 think I, I think that's good. Do we have other questions? I, I think we covered everything pretty well. Um, so thank you to everybody who dialed in and listened to us today. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. If you are not receiving our publications yet, we encourage you to visit our website and sign up under the publications tab. And we also invite you to check out our blog. It's thompsonhindsmarttrade.com. And otherwise, thank you again for your interest and have a nice day. Thank you.